television highlights of the news of yesteryear. Bandit at the border. Pancho Villa, fabled brigand who almost precipitated war between the United States and Mexico. It's March 9, 1916, and Villa, at the head of 1,500 troops, crosses the border to raid New Mexico. Here is the Mexican marauder whose men killed 17 civilians and eight soldiers in the foray. Repercussions were immediate. Soon, the famed Texas Rangers set after Villa and his men. A few of his band were captured, but Villa escaped. These two prisoners from his ragged army remained in American hands, even as official Washington detailed John J. Pershing, then a brigadier general, to the task of bringing in Villa dead or alive. One week after the bandits' raid on New Mexico, Pershing took 6,000 men across the Rio Grande to find Pancho Villa. Despite the presence of American fighting men on Mexican soil, Villa, born Doroteo Arango, was not found. Border towns were militarized, and on April 15th in Paral came the incident that brought action from the Mexican government. A skirmish between our troops and Mexico's in Paral resulted in the death of 40 Mexicans. Despite official protest by Mexican President Carranza, American border towns became regular army centers. Buildings in Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico were armed and the Customs House in Naco, Arizona, barricaded and fortified. With the Mexican army called out, minor outbreaks kept Washington on the alert. In charge of U.S. censorship at the time, the man destined for our highest military honors, Douglas MacArthur. But back in Mexico, General Gonzalez of the Carranza forces in June attacked a Pershing scout force. Cavalry quickly answered the challenge. Mexican troops retreated before the American fighting men. Gonzalez withdrew, and a week after these historic pictures were made, Villa fled to the hills. The United States was to spend a total of $130 million in vain effort to apprehend the bandit chief who was to meet death in an ambush, July 18, 1923. By November 1916, all that remained for a complete cessation of hostilities was signing of a protocol which resulted in the exchange of prisoners shown here. These captured Mexicans are about to be returned to their homeland. America's Negro battalions returned to El Paso. Once again, Mexico and the United States are neighbors in peace as Mexican officers join ours to watch our troops return. The Villa incident was over, and one American soldier finds a special way to celebrate. Well... Yesterday's newsreel has brought you history as it was made. The 1916 clash brought about by the bandit Pancho Villa. As early as 1929, Germany was experimenting with tailless airplanes, one of the first of which is shown here in test flight in Berlin. You are watching the revolutionary aviation trial that 18 years later was to result in our own YB-49, introduced October 21st, 1947. Watch this plane and then compare it with these pictures of the YB-49. Here it is, wingspan of 172 feet, gross weight of over 200,000 pounds, with room for seven crew members and six off-duty crew. This flying bat superseded the XB-35, first of America's planes employing this radical construction on a large-scale operation. The XB-35 was motor-driven, but the YB-49 is jet-propelled. Here it is, the climax of 18 years of experiment of tailless flying ships.
early 1920s see the return to America of the world's most famous basso, Theodore Shelyapin. Greatest role for Shelyapin was Mephistopheles, sung at La Scala, but his American triumph was in Boris Goodenough. On the same boat is Met star Frida Hempel, born in Leipzig in 1885 and renowned for her singing in Traviata and Rigoletto, among other operas. It's 1918, somewhere in France, and America's ace of World War I, Eddie Rickenbacker, is honored by General Gerard. Washington in 1930 sees Rickenbacker awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor by President Hoover. With peacetime aviation achievements to come, this is Eddie Rickenbacker. It's 1928, and you're looking at the birth of a landmark, the George Washington Bridge. Spanning the Hudson and connecting New York with New Jersey, the bridge took three years to build. Channel span of the construction is 3,500 feet, with total span between anchorages 4,760 feet. All towers are completed here, and cables are in the process of being strung. When the bridge is finished, it will have a deck width of 115 feet, and will lie 250 feet above high waters of the Hudson at its center. The George Washington Bridge was officially opened October 24, 1931, in a ceremony that attracted national dignitaries and state officials. This is Franklin D. Roosevelt, then governor of New York State, about to cut the ribbon that officially opened the huge span to the public. Climax of three years of actual construction work, this is the overwater link between New York and New Jersey, the George Washington Bridge. In 1927, and President Calvin Coolidge is on a goodwill tour of the Northwest, a tour which was to see him express his political intentions for the following year in exactly six words. Despite popular opinion to the contrary, Coolidge had an excellent sense of humor, and his periodic donning of cowboy and Indian attire was merely to give people a laugh. Here with Chief Wombo Tokaha of the Sioux tribe, Coolidge is made an honorary chief. This scene is Deadwood, North Dakota, but when the president arrived in Rapid City, South Dakota on this tour, he made the epic observation pertinent to his 1928 plans. He said, quote, I do not choose to run. Most frugal of American presidents, it is ironic that the years during which he was in the White House saw an almost continuous bull market, factory productive efficiency raised by 30%, and general prosperity. Closing Indian traditional dance. Hail to the chief! We're back to Missouri in 1928 to see what the St. Louis woman was wearing. Dresses, you may remember, were short and curves an unmentionable subject. This is an afternoon dress with square neckline, long sleeve blouse, short skirt. White satin evening gowns featuring slit sides and one exposed shoulder. On the left is a short brocade coat with tight turban. On the right, a cocktail dress with full brim chapeau. Ermine wraparound coat with white fox cuffs and collar trimming. These were the fashions of 28. Oh, great. This is Winston Churchill in 1926. The scene is Rome, and Britain's leading statesman is on vacation at the Baths of Caracalla. Churchill's comments after a visit to Mussolini, I am a great believer in fascism, 
for Italy. The 1922 Walker Cup match. Darwin, British team captain, bangs out a long one. We're in Southampton, New York, and America's skull faces include Chick Evans and Francis We Met. Bobby Jones beats Roger Weatherhead, and Great Britain is defeated as America claims the cup. Later in the year, we're at Lake Placid for the figure skating exhibition. This is Hala Kosloff doing practically the same stunts on ice that you see today, only the costume is a little different. Miss Kosloff is going nowhere in particular, but she looks well going there. Flash finish of the performance. Not bad, not bad at all. Moving over to Bristol, New Hampshire, we find young Lynn Hill and some acrobatics. Skates are on his feet, so he walks on his hands. Maybe it's easier that way. Whoops, careful Lynn. Still the same lad in figure work and cartwheels, done this time the hard way. It's great, but I want to know only one thing. Why? An experiment known as the chair walk. I'm convinced, my boy. Yes, sir, Lynn, you win. <laughs> 